All right, there's no denying it. I know when you saw Kevin, you got excited. <laughs> and now you're disappointed, and so you've got like 30 seconds. Hit the doors. I'll close my eyes. We'll act like it never happened. I'll find you. <laughs> well, it's good to be back. I'm glad we remembered to show up on a Sunday morning after last week. Uh, we get out of these rhythms, right? And it kind of messes with everything. And I apologize. I'm trying to get over something, apparently, that never started. So I remember... Um, being 17 years old, and somehow I thought it'd be a really good idea to go to a military school for college. Somebody should have hit me in the face, um, because that was not for me. If you know me, that's not me. And, uh, and I remember walking through the arches of Virginia Military Institute, and they have a quote from Stonewall Jackson. It says, you may be whatever you resolve to be. I remember thinking, what have I gotten myself into? And then we get to meet the cadre, and the cadre is a bunch of upperclassmen, drill sergeants. And I remember them rushing to us and teaching us to strain. And straining is an exaggerated form of attention. Your shoulders are back, your chin's tucked in. I can't even do it because now I'm old. <clears throat> and you had to stand like this. And then they would show us exactly where we could walk, and they called us rats. And the rats had to follow a line. It was called the rat line. And we had to follow a certain place inside a barracks where we could go up against the pole, away from the doors of the upperclassmen, certain steps you could use, and you had to pound every single step. Any upperclassman could stop you at any time and quiz you on anything about the school. And if you didn't know it, you were dropping and giving push-ups. Even if you knew it, you would drop and give push-ups sometimes. And so in that realizing, again, what have I gotten myself into? But then we learned of a little secret. And this secret was, to us rats, a very interesting and fascinating one because we found out that alumni could come back, these guys that had graduated could come back, and they would stand at the bottom of these gates where it says you may be to resolve whatever you may be, and he looks at it and he says, rats, get out! And at that point, 300 college freshmen, all straining, drop their strain and book wherever they're going as fast as they can, and they don't stop for anything or anybody. It's this amazing sight to see of all of this freedom all of a sudden just happening. Nothing was going to stop me. I climbed four flights of stairs in like two seconds because I'm not getting stopped, right? And you get in your room and, oh, okay. Oh, what just happened, right? And now you're just like, and I, you know, now you're just waiting for like the alumni days when they're coming back. You're like, it's coming. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. And you're just excited when that happens. I think we love freedom, don't we? We love the idea of the prisoner breaking free and throwing off the chains. This is why for guys especially, like we like these movies, The Rambo, where the guy comes in, kicks open the door, he's got a bandana on, he's you know, laying down the justice and freeing the slaves. And we love that, don't we? Okay, just me. Cool. <clears throat> See, we are, um, we are now in our 200th week of our Acts series. <laughs> wow! Wake up! <clears throat> we are going through the book of Acts, and what we're seeing is some amazing things. We're seeing freedom happen. Somebody asks, how long can you guys make this go? And I'm like, pretty much forever. Like, <laughs> we, as long as it's going to take, we can get through this. So, Here's the thing, in the book of Acts, we see Jesus giving his marching orders to his disciples. At the end of Matthew, he says, go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them everything I've commanded. And then Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them in a powerful, powerful way. And we see thousands of people believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he's died for your sins. And now you don't have to pay the price of those sins. And then persecution breaks out, and it's led by this young, hotshot lawyer named Saul. And we'll actually talk about him in a few weeks. And see, because of that persecution, it pushes the gospel out of Jerusalem. They were content to stay there in their comfort zone, but persecution made them and forced them to be pushed out. And now what we're going to see is we're going to see this shift in the book of Acts from Jerusalem-centric to now as it goes out into all the world. And we're going to be talking about what's often considered 
a dirty word, evangelism. Some of the anxiety starts pumping up a little bit, right? Like, oh, sharing my faith. No, I don't want to do that. See, I think a lot of us get the wrong impression. And many of us have had bad experiences with evangelism. And then we end up with drive-by guiltings and some uh, some well-intentioned preacher stands up and says, are you sending people to hell because you're not going to share your faith? Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. See, I remember the heavy-handed youth programs and they bring you into a dark room and shine a bright light at your face like you're getting hit by a train. And then you, this really happened. And then you end up like in the judgment seat before God and you're just like, having to defend yourself, and we miss the point completely that Jesus is the one who defends you. That Jesus has done the work on the cross for you. And that you just have to walk in that, that new reality. That everything has changed, but everything still looks the same. Some of us will go, and we'll go down maybe to a stadium or something, and we'll see the guy with the bullhorn standing on top of the box. I was in Eastgate, and there was a guy doing that in Eastgate. I'm like, this is the place you picked? Not a lot of pedestrian foot traffic here, but that's what he picked. And he says, you're on your way to hell. And let me just, let me just say, I, I think those people have good intentions. But we're missing the point if we're screaming at people about the truth of God's love. See, if you had a cure for a terminal disease, how would you share it? I mean, I, I can't even imagine getting mad at somebody for having cancer. No, we, we love them through this. We have a relationship. We're there to serve them through this. You have a cure for a terminal disease called sin. How would you share that news? See, I think we feel guilty and defeated. And maybe you feel defeated when you hear these amazing stories from missionaries overseas or pastors I mean, I can just tell you the last time I was on a flight, I had the middle seat, the B seat. Everybody hates that seat, right? And I'm like, how do I talk to this guy next to me? And so I just open my Bible, right? And he starts looking at me. He's like, what are you reading? I'm like, oh, I'm reading the Bible. And let me tell you about Jesus. And the guy next to me in seat A was like, oh, what is going on? I want to hear about Jesus, right? Right there, they pray and give their lives to Jesus. Then the stewardess comes down and says, what's going on? What's happening? Then she starts crying, giving her life to Jesus. And then she's like, hey, can you go and announce this over the intercom to everybody? And I get to shit. This didn't happen. <laughs> right? Remember, not a drive-by guilting. But that's what we hear. And we're like, oh, I can't even talk to like my neighbor. We think that that's what it's going to take. And the reality is what I want to talk about today is there are some things that a lot of you are already doing to share your faith. I want to look at Acts chapter 8. If you have your Bibles with you, would you open to that? You can grab one in front of you in the pew, or if you have a phone with an app, open up to Acts chapter 8. And we're going to look at the way one man shared the gospel with someone. And I want to remove today some of the stigma behind evangelism. That is basically gospeling. Look, if Google can be a verb, so can gospel. It's <clears throat> sharing your faith, your story, our story, which is Jesus' story. And now, like I said, I want many of us to see that we're already doing these things. We're actually doing this already. And we don't have to worry about looking foolish or looking like a bigot because I know that's some of the concerns I have. And so open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, right side of your Bible, find the guy's names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. If you get to the Ians, you've gone too far, go left. So this, so far, like I said, persecution has broken out into into the church and has pushed it. And this guy, Saul, is leading this persecution. And there's one guy named Philip. And Philip um, was an early deacon uh, in Acts, and he was slated to serve the Greek widows. And he gets pushed out of Jerusalem and into an area called Samaria. And Samaria, Samaritans were considered these half-blood types. They didn't worship in Jerusalem. They didn't worship really the one true God. They kind of did their own thing. And the Jews hated them. And he goes and he shares the good news, and it explodes in Samaria. And during the midst of this revival, or I guess it's a Bible. There's no re. It hadn't happened yet. During, 
wake up, everybody. During this, <clears throat> this time, he, he now gets called by the Spirit to leave this successful ministry. And the, God calls him to something different. And so look at Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. See, there's two roads out of Jerusalem that go down to Gaza. There's one that was highly populated, and there's one that was basically empty, the desert road. This is the road less traveled. God takes Philip from something successful and puts him in the desert. He was living as as an example of what God could do, and then God called him to something that I'm guessing didn't look like what he expected it to look like. And so this brings us to point one. We have to be the work of God before we do the work of God. We have to be the work of God before we do the work of God. You want to have an impact at work? Then you need to be prepared to follow what God wants. You want to have an impact in your marriage and a marriage that lasts? Then you have to be prepared to be obedient. See, obedient is so important. It's much easier for God to direct us when we're being obedient. The same way you ever had a car break down, right? And you're trying to push it. It's very hard to do, right? It's much easier to steer a moving car. See, we have to get in motion. And I'm not sure how the angel appeared and showed up for Philip. But I think we get these nudges sometimes that somebody's on your heart. You're thinking about somebody often. And see, the reality is for me, I know that's from God because I'm an incredibly selfish person. Just ask my wife. The fact that I'm thinking about somebody else, I'm praying for somebody else, I'm like, man, I really should call that person. The Spirit prompting me for those things. See, the Spirit of God is working in you, Christian. And as we walk in obedience, the voice of God becomes clearer to us. So many times we sit and we wait, God, is what, what's your plan? And there's people around us that we can be serving. And as we do that, oh, yeah, it becomes clearer who he's put in front of us. See, I, I walked around in my life and claiming to be a Christian with a ton of head knowledge and very little heart empowerment. And what changed for me was getting my feet into motion, that as my feet moved, everything that was in my head got sucked down into my heart. As I began to serve other people and get outside of myself, I realized, wow, it's really not all about me. This world would have you believe it's all about you. But when I read the gospel, it's about Jesus saving me to now go tell others. And so as Philip's obeying, look what happens in verse 27. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Some of you maybe have Candace, that's not a name, it's like Pharaoh. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and all his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? See, Philip is nudged and told to go to the desert, and he runs into this Ethiopian, this high official. And so we know a few things about this man. We know he was wealthy, because he's in charge of the treasury, and he works for the queen. And we also know that he, in his travels, decided to buy a scroll, and he buys the scroll of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is not a short book, is it? It would have been expensive. The process of writing writing it out on a scroll was expensive, and he buys this scroll. So we know he had money. We also know we're going to read, he has a chauffeur. There's somebody driving the chariot. He came from an area, Ethiopian, bigger than just what the Ethiopian country is now in Africa. It's a whole region. And this region believed in many gods. And I'm guessing because of his trip, it left him wanting. Who is the one true God out of all these gods? He had to know. But Philip isn't told any of this, is he? He's just told to go to the desert. 
He's told to do something that makes no sense. God, I have a lot of work here. God, the people really need me here. God, I, I, I don't know why you'd be asking. He doesn't do any of that. He just goes. He's told to, to go to the road less traveled. And as he obeys, he sees the chariot. And he goes up to that chariot and he hears this man reading. And I imagine in this that the chariot was moving just kind of just as a trot. And Philip has to come up and jog next to him. I can't do this for long. Okay. See, point number two, we have to look and pray for open doors. Look and pray for open doors. And I would add this, and maybe you can write this. We look by listening. Listening to God and listening to those around us. We have to always be looking for open doors. See, far too often the bad examples that we have for evangelism, for sharing faith, they're, they're so off-putting. And so we end up not looking for open doors. We see these examples of people just kicking open these doors. And God never called them to open that door. And so we get worried, well, what if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? What if they, well, they might. It's a chance for you to grow and learn, right? The reality is there's people that God has already placed in your life that you can talk to, that are on your level. They're not some high academic if you're not an academic. Right now, if you are an academic, then God has placed some people in your life that you are suited to talk to. So look and pray for open doors. Don't be tone deaf to what's happening in somebody's life. We have to be ready. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks, <clears throat> asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. It's interesting. He doesn't say give facts. He says give a reason for the hope. And so many of us in our fact-driven world think I have to have it all figured out first. But some of you have hope. You have a reason why you keep smiling even though the doctor gave you that pronouncement. You keep smiling even though the bank account is empty. You keep smiling even though your marriage is on the rocks. You keep smiling even though everything seems like it's going wrong because you have a hope in Christ. Amen. And so for us, this means, God, who's in my life that you are working on? God, give me opportunities to share the hope I have. See, I, I don't know how prayer works. I just know we need to do it. I don't, I don't have this all figured out. This isn't about theological answers. See, I've met very few people. I've met some, but I've met very few people who aren't Christians because of their logical, fact-driven doubts. Rather, it's their emotions. Somebody did something to them. Somebody said something to them. And you have a chance to help reframe the picture, reframe their questions around love and grace. Share hopes, not facts. See, our, our faith is firmly grounded in historical facts. I believe that. We've talked about that here. But it's the hope that we have in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection that has power to change. Look how Philip responds to the opportunity he finds himself in because of obedience. Look at verse 30. It says, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he says, Do you understand what you're reading? How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So then he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So you don't have to have a degree to do this. I'm a dedicated neurotic. I, I have to learn and study and collect pieces of paper that say I'm smart. All right, that's not you. That's okay. There's so many things I've learned that would do nobody any good. Right? And then I'm, I'm left having to break it down and go, okay, God, what, what does it come down to? 
And look what he says. He just starts with a simple question. What you reading? Point number three, we need to start with where they are, not with what we know. We need to start with where they are, not with what we know. And again, what, what if they ask a question I don't understand and I don't know the answer to? You know, we ask questions, how are you doing? What are you reading? What's going on? Philip doesn't start yelling at the people on the desert road. Or begin by sharing everything he knows about Jesus. He takes the time to run or walk alongside this man and listen. And then the guy invites him in. We have people who have invited us into our, their lives already. Because we've cared and we've asked and we've listened. There's somebody you're thinking about right now. And I would say 80% of us are already doing this already. Some of you might be sitting here today, this morning, because somebody cared enough to listen to you. And they cared enough to invite you here today. And you should know that, like that person that invited you, there are people all throughout this church that would quite literally give you the shirt off their back if that's what you needed. And they love you exactly where you are, but they also love you enough to not leave you there alone. We do this because what Jesus has done for us on the cross, not because we're trying to follow a list of rules, of do's or don'ts, but because we've been so loved that we can't help but love others. See, Philip starts where this guy is, and then they read this. Look at verse 32. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as the lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. See, the thought about sharing our faith, some of it gives us like DEFCON 5 anxiety. But the reality is, for some of you, the thought of getting up on here at stage and talking freaks you out. Guess what? God hasn't called you to do that, and that's fine. But he has called you to a relationship with a coworker, a neighbor, a friend to share the hope that you have. Point number four, we need to show them what Jesus did, not what they must do. And see, we always do this. If someone asks what it means to be a Christian for you, where would you start? Would you start with what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, or would you start with what a list of things Christians don't do? I think for me, I'm tempted with that. I don't lie, cheat, steal, cuss, drink, smoke, right? Come sign up. The reality, though, is that Jesus loves you enough that while you were still a sinner, he died for you. I know some of you have been in the church long enough that you've forgotten what it was like to be a sinner. Just let that one sink in. But you were once a sinner too. And now you're living in a new reality of what it means to be saved. That those sins, past, present, and future, are covered with his blood, and you're walking in this new reality. Again, I'll say it again. Everything has changed, but everything still looks the same. You're not perfect. Can we stop acting like we are? Can we stop getting upset for people, at people who don't know Jesus, that they're not acting like they know Jesus? Why would someone act like Christ if they haven't been saved by Christ? And we're so busy pushing this. And some of you are going to disagree with me, and that's fine. I'll give you a hug. 
But we're so busy pushing the morality of Christianity that we forget about the good news of it. That while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And if we're being honest, a lot of us are having a hard time just living the reality of being saved as it is, right? When you look at my life as a Christian, I go, it's not that much different from his. And then we go to this <clears throat> temptation to be formed by morality and, and we say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And maybe I'm the only one that's done that. But the reality is that as soon as I do that, I'm negating what Christ has done on the cross. Because it doesn't matter how bad that guy is or how good I think I am. We all need Jesus. See, when we emphasize the morality, meaning the good and the bad things that we need to do, the good things that we need to do versus the bad things, when we emphasize morality over Jesus' work on the cross, all we're doing is populating hell with good people. Because being a good person doesn't save you. Following Jesus does. It doesn't matter how many good things I throw at myself or do into this world. We all know some people that are atheists that don't know Jesus at all, refuse to say that God exists, that are good people. So what sets you apart? It's the work that Jesus did, not your works for Jesus. See, the Bible doesn't start with what, with what you must do. It starts with what Jesus did. Discipleship, following after Jesus, being a disciple of his, isn't just some six-week course with a binder and a study guide and a written exam and some interview with the pastor, see if you actually know all the answers. So we've done this because it feels really good to check boxes, doesn't it? See, discipleship is about becoming more like Jesus, his character, replacing yours over time. So the question that I ask myself is, do I look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday? Did Jesus love me when I was still in my sin, when I was still in my junk, when I still was miserable? He loved me enough to pull me out of that and call me his son. See, it's through the way we live that people will stop and take notice. What's different about you? Why would you do this? Why, why would you do that? I, I don't understand. And then we take the time to share. See, I love the Ethiopian's response to Philip's teaching. Look at verse 36. It says, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. There's the driver. <clears throat> then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Azosus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So something amazing happens at this baptism. At baptism. And imagine the guy puts you under, comes back up, and he's like, hey, and disappears, right? <clears throat> I like to imagine that when the Spirit does this, there's like a smoke bomb, and then he just appears in the smoke. That's just me. All right. I got a flair for the dramatic, though. Okay, so, but in this, that the Spirit drives him there for a purpose, that he knows, that the Spirit knows this Ethiopian is going to be there. And church tradition actually tells us that this eunuch went back to Ethiopia, and that's how the gospel start, started spreading there. <clears throat> and so with this, this idea that the Spirit is moving, and we don't understand, we just have to be obedient. Just have to be obedient. At hearing the good news, the eunuch believes and is baptized. See, so taking to the street, the proper response to the gospel is belief and baptism. Belief and baptism. See, there's some of you that need to make this decision. You say, yes, I believe, but you've, you've never 
walked into the water. He never made that public confession. There is no going back. See, look, here's water. What is stopping you? And then there's others of you who are saying, look, I've shared my faith. I've done this, but I've never seen anybody get baptized over it. Let me give you a warning about this way of thinking. We need to gauge our success not by their response, but by our obedience. Let me say that again. We need to gauge our success not by their response, but by our obedience. I love the example of the call to discipleship we see Jesus give in John chapter 1. <clears throat> the beginning of John sets up this amazing thing as telling us who Jesus is, that he existed before time, and now he's come in the flesh. And he goes and gets baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And some of John's uh, disciples, John had followers, they saw Jesus and they saw the big deal that John the Baptist made about him. And they said, well, let's go follow him, right? If that's actually the Messiah, let's follow him. And they start following after him at a distance that's just close enough to talk, but just awkward enough. Like, what are you doing? He says, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And, and it seems like a confident question, but I imagine that it probably wasn't all that confident. Just kind of following what do you want? No one else out there, guys. Like, what do you want? Uh, where are you staying? And what does Jesus say? He says, come. He replied, and you will see. Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. See, at its core, the call of discipleship is the question, what do you want? And Jesus' response is always, come and see. Jesus is standing asking you now, what do you want? What is it that you want? Why are you following? What are you trying to figure out? And it's for you to be honest. And he says, come and see. See, some of, some of you stop and you're, you're overthinking this. I don't know enough, but I wish I did. I, 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 need, I need more. I need, I need to study more. Yeah, and that may be. Some of you just need to risk it. Risk looking foolish for a moment. Because the reality is someone who told you about Jesus risked being foolish for you. Why would we think people would hold that against us? Some of us do need to study more. We need to get into this more. That second point, to get more understanding from our Bibles, we must dive in. So many of us are content with the one verse, verse of the day, meme that we can post to Facebook, and we're like, ah, there. Got it. Dig into this. There are, we live in a world now that there are more resources and access than any time other in history and we don't read this. And again, this isn't to make you feel guilty. It's just to recognize the power of what we have. See, the spiritual disciplines, reading the Bible is one of them. Prayer, silence, solitude, community. They open us up to what the Spirit is doing as He's transforming us. They tune our heart to God's frequency. And see, this is why small groups are so important as we get back into those soon. This is so important to connect you to other like-minded people, and some maybe that aren't so like-minded, to learn together and grow. So we can read this together. Don't read it alone. That's how cults start. I've got a really great idea. No. Open it up. Test it. Hey, what do, you, what do you think about this? What do you think's going on? Because we have so many Bible studies, oh, I think this. That's great. But what is it actually saying? So let's get really practical. How do I do this? And I'm going to go through these really quickly. How do I share my faith? If you have your Bibles, flip over to Romans. Just go to the right, one book, Romans. 
And I treat my Bible like life's textbooks. I write in these because the reality is I don't always have a pastor around to help explain things. So I'm taking notes constantly here. And my pages are filled with notes that remind me of lessons that God is teaching me. And so I want to give you something for this. And the verses are listed at the bottom of your outline that you have there. So you can go home if you don't have this and write this down. But I want to give you something uh, we call a tree. And I want to teach you what this looks like. So how do I do this? All you have to do is remember the book of Romans. All you have to do is remember the book of Romans. So turn to Romans, if you have this old school paper Bible like I do. And right at the top of the first page of Romans, write 1, 19 through 20. 1, 19 through 20. And And then flip to 1, 19 through 20. And again, this book of Romans was written by a guy named Paul heard about him earlier, called Saul. And he comes to faith, which we'll talk about in the next couple weeks. <clears throat> but he's writing about Jesus to a group of Romans in the city of Rome, aptly named, I think. And he's talking about why this thing won't stop. He says, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. You see, there is a creator. There's design. There's details in it. And he wants to be seen and to be known by his creations, by what he's made. Design always leads to a designer. The world is screaming, look at God. God wants to be seen. And so if you have your paper Bible right there next to Romans 19.20, write Romans 3.23 and then flip to 3.23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God is a designer and a creator and he's made a creation, but all this creation has sinned and separated themselves from God. Sin means if there is a God and he did create everything, then he gets to make the rules and he is holy and set apart and we, because of sin, are separated from having a relationship with him. So next to Romans 3.23, and this is why I gave you all the, all the verses on your outline. Next to Romans 3.23, write Romans 5.8, or just 5.8 right there. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. You say, well, what does a guy dying 2,000 years ago on a Roman crucifixion stick have anything to do with me? Well, I'm glad you asked. Write 623. 623 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, We've earned just like you go to work and maybe you earn a salary or an hourly wage. You earn, because of your sin, you earn death. If you choose life without God, he'll give you exactly what you want in the next life. If you don't choose God in this life, why would you want to spend forever with him? It's like the people who say, oh, you know, I miss them, they died, I'll cry at their funeral, but I don't want to go on vacation with them. We all have people like that, right? Right? Like, why would God do that? That would be a worse punishment. You spent all eternity with somebody you didn't want to be with. And now it's the reality of us sharing that. And look how you get the right 10, 9 through 11. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in me will never be put to shame. And we see from Paul's example, when people believed all in Acts, we'll see it, they're baptized immediately. The response, belief and baptism go hand in hand. I have to believe and accept what God has done for me and walk in obedience to that. Now write Romans 8, 1 through 2, flip to the left. He says, therefore, because of all of this, everything he's written up to this point, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
Come out of hiding. Stop trying to be good. There is no condemnation. You are not condemned. You are not looked down upon for being in sin. Come out of that into this new reality. And now finally write Romans 12, 1 and 2 next to 8, 1 and 2. And flip over a few pages. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What does God want from you in return for his death and life on the cross? He wants your life. Living and devoted to God. Being transformed by him over time. Buckle up, it's going to be quite the ride. So some of you say, I've never done that. I've never stopped and given my life to Jesus. I want that salvation. I want that freedom. Look, here's water. See, we're forever grateful for the person who shared Christ with us. Yet somehow we're afraid that we might be resented by someone that we share this message with. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Some of you have a decision to make. I'm going to invite the band up right now. There's a few of us in this room And you're feeling that pull and that tug right now because God is calling you to talk to somebody, to share your hope. I want to encourage you to do that. If, you're like, if you still feel like, man, I'm not sure how to do that, would you talk to me? Would you talk to the leadership in this church about how to do that? And there's others here, and you're sitting and you're going, I believe, but I've never been baptized. I've never walked into that water. I've never made that public confession. Today's the day. Today's the day to step into that new reality. There's others of you in here saying, how would I do that? I don't have any hope right now. I, I've been baptized. I've walked this. I'm trying to be obedient, and I have nothing left to give. Can I just pray for you today? Can we just pray for you as a church If there's a way that we can support you and help you, would you tell us, don't do this alone. You're not alone. Don't believe that lie. We're going to sing a song of invitation now. And I'll be right down here. As the band sings, feel that prompting. Don't push it down. Don't suppress it. Risk looking foolish. And that's only the feeling of it. It's not actually foolishness. Now let's talk. Let's pray.